I'm going to talk about risk management as a general approach to translation, particularly looking at what people do when they're solving problems. And the reason why I'm doing it might be clear if we refer to where we were last week. Um, I've hoped to have pointed out that there was a paradigm called equivalence, which is limited with respect to what it can explain. We looked at Scopos, but I argued that that was also short-changed or is limited by its inherent essentialism, the fact that people think there is a purpose, one Scopos, and that that's one fixed thing, an indeterminist approach to communication and to language in general suggests that that is a limited theory. The problem, though, is that the, the indeterminacy that I presented to you last week I think explains a lot of the problems we have when we translate, at least philosophically, but it doesn't help us translate. That theory won't decide the problem for us. It'll say what the problem is. Oh, I have a difficulty here. Oh, it's indeterminacy. All right, now what do we do? So I've been looking for some kind of guideline that can help us make decisions that are valid, useful, and successful in situations where there are several things to choose from, if you remember the model I presented, and there's no absolute rule about which is right, which is wrong. That was my first lecture. There's no absolute rule, at least in a translation problem that concerns translation. So for some years, for about 10 years, I've been working on approaches to uh, risk management. It's a huge field in business, um, and most of the decisions that are made um, in the economy are based on risk management. And I look at the decision-making that we talk about, and nobody seems to have applied it. So I've been playing with uh, this idea for a very long time, only this year have I submitted for publication a paper on it. Now I'm happy that I've got a sort of grounding in it, and it's in a presentable state. However, this is a lecture, a talk that I've given many, many times, and you'll help me improve it even more. Here's an example. A birth certificate, right? It has what? It's got the name of the father, the name of the mother, the date, the place that you were born, and sometimes the name of a midwife. Midwife? In German, Deutsch? Yes. Hebammer. Okay. All right. There you go. Uh, and it's a very simple document. It's, it's, it's three or four or five noun phrases. Now, if you're going to make a mistake as a translator, where would you make the mistake? In the name of the person born? I don't think so. In the date of birth? No, sir. Uh, but the name of the midwife? Yeah. If you're going to make a mistake, you could make it there. Because it doesn't matter. Now, this is a true example. I, I take it from... Uh, a scholar called Roberto Mayoral, who translates for the Pakistani community around Granada in Spain. He gets all these birth certificates in Urdu and English from Pakistan, and they all give the name, they all give the date, they all give the father. Some don't give the name of the mother, which is difficult. And there is this wonderful woman called Masawe, who is the, the birth, the, the midwife on all these birth certificates. All of them. And so he translates Mass Away, and everybody translates Mass Away, and we understand that this wonderful woman has brought about 5,000 Pakistanis into the world all by herself. Now, the sad fact is that the issuing authorities in Pakistan don't care who the midwife is, and so they write in Urdu, midwife, Mass Away. The authorities in Spain similarly don't care who the midwife is, so they accept the translation misaway as a proper name, when in fact it's, it's just the term for midwife. Uh, so it's technically a mistake, and nobody cares. All right? Now, in the document, 
Linguistically, these are noun phrases. Same level of difficulty in all of them, but one place you can make a mistake, and it doesn't matter, and the other places you, you do, if you make a mistake, it matters a lot. All right, you get taken to court for forgery or perjury if you're in a, in a, in a, in a court case. Why is it that some things are high risk and some things are low risk? Why is it that we can make mistakes in low risk parts of text but not in high risk parts of text? That's my question. The linguistics of equivalence can't solve that problem because they're all the same. Scopos might get there. Ah, but the purpose of the text is to give this information, but not that. Okay? If you get a Scopos that can indicate that in this text there are actually several purposes at work, but some have more weight than others, given the needs of the communication participants, then we're getting it. We started to think about risk as a way of making decisions. Most importantly, it's not just decisions, it's also effort. Uh, this approach will tell you, ah, work hard on those things that are high risk and don't work hard on the others. Okay? Only work hard when there's high risk, which means don't work hard when there's low risk. I teach this to my students in Spain and the thing they remember is don't work too hard. But I'm not, no, it is, because in the beginning, big novices tend to work hard on everything. Therefore, they go slow, and they get frustrated, and they can't find the solution to problems. Whereas professionals tend to redistribute their effort. I'll come to this later. So they really work hard where it counts, and go very quickly when it's just perfunctory, when it's a low-risk part of the text. Okay, so there's a valuable lesson, a very simple lesson, but one that often is not taught. Most importantly, to teach that lesson, and to teach people how to use this very simple risk management, I don't have to refer to equivalents. I mean, it doesn't matter if the low-risk elements are not equivalent. And perhaps for the high-risk elements, that's where we have to work the most, that's where we have to use the advanced forms, transformational forms of equivalence. So much for the simple theory. Now for the philosophical difficulties. What is risk? What is risk? We, we, we use it, we use a notion of risk in our daily lives when we decide to go somewhere and not go somewhere else. I think in two weeks I'm invited to go to a conference in Tunisia. I am deciding, what is risk? Do I really want to go to a conference in Tunisia? Hmm, I'm, I'm going to, my wife won't let me go. Having this today. All right, in a communication situation where there's a purpose and there are participants and there's a text of some kind, I propose that risk is the probability of failing. Not of anyone failing, of the communication failing the whole situation failing. We meet to have a negotiation, to decide something, and we fail to make that decision. Or we meet to fall in love, and we don't fall in love. Or okay, anything, anything you like. Okay? Uh, we're not meeting the success conditions that people were looking for when they came into the communication situation. It's a very, very broad notion of it. You can get more specific if you go into it when you look at um, the purpose of the communication being cooperation. And that simply means mutual benefits. That when we come together to talk about something, we both get out of it more than we put into it. Okay? I win and you win. Communication is not a zero sum game where if I win, you lose. Well, sometimes it is. People do have arguments. But basically, I think they like arguing because they went into the argument. Okay. Uh, it, 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 okay. This is where the, the philosophy gets difficult. But 
let's accept that there are mutual benefits. We both get more out of it than we put into it. And the only real condition of risk of the communication failing is that what we get out of it is less than what we put into it. That our effort outweighs the benefits. If that happens, don't communicate. And if we have time, I'm going to give an example of a situation where communication fails for precisely those reasons. You'll see, you'll see it in the example, I think, better than here. You could start writing equations that the value of the effort I put in is less than the value of the benefits I get out. For all participants, then it is successful. How do you measure the values? Well, we do it all the time. Oh, I'm not going to speak with that person because we talk for hours and never get anywhere. I'll talk with that person over there because it's short, it's clear, I understand it, we get to a decision. Okay? We make these choices. We do these calculations very intuitively, but they're, they're done uh, subjectively every time we decide who, with whom we're going to enter into a conversation. And I think from that everyday practice, we can get an idea of what risk is and the role it plays in the communication situation. In translation, I think there are therefore at least three kinds of risk. This is a very general theory of communication, and the three kinds of this. Every time you have to make a decision and you're not sure, and this is the form of translation decisions, there's uncertainty. And every time you're facing uncertainty, there is an element of risk. It's always there because of indeterminacy. That doesn't solve problems but it's there. That's one level of risk. Okay? The other is credibility. What's the worst thing that can happen to a translator or interpreter in the communication situation? The worst thing you can lose is your credibility, your trustworthiness. If the communicators are acting through a mediator and they start to doubt the mediator, they start to check on you, or they don't believe that what you're providing is a valid rendition, you can no longer function. The communication will break down by definition. Everybody will want exactitude, and exactitude is too expensive. Too much effort goes in, communication fails. So the translator runs the constant risk of losing credibility. Another word for trustworthiness, the capacity to be trusted. And our decisions have to take care of that risk. The most important kind, though, is what I'm calling communicative risk. And that's the risk that the whole act fails, as I just explained previously. So there are these three levels. Uncertainty on the actual decision you make. Credibility, your status within the communication situation. And then the communicative risk, people getting out of it more than they put into it. Failure can happen on all those three levels. Success can also happen on all those three levels. To explain how, let me move to another example. Are you okay with the theory so far? There's no mathematics, it's just everyday life. Okay. This is a true example. My class was translating a website from my university. This is a website for foreign students. Welcome to Tarragona. We've got the, it's true, they have a photo of a beach and a book, you know, welcome to Tarragona. How serious is this going to be? And then underneath the photo of the beach and the book and have a great time and all this stuff, you've got the sentence, foreign students in Spanish will need to convalidar or homologar their first degree. This is to do a master's, okay? Any Spanish speakers here? Nobody is confessing to knowing... Does, do you know what convalidar means or homologar? No? Yes? No? Any guesses? No, we're not, we're not going to guess. Validate is not bad. So why are there two words there? Hmm. Okay, uh, it's a, we have a translation problem. 
What do you do with a translation problem? Generate possible solutions. How can we get possible solutions? Any ideas? No? Okay, um, you could hit a dictionary and find convalidate. Uh, you could invent homologate, which doesn't exist, but you could invent it if you wanted. You could leave it in Spanish. Why not? You won't tell any lies. Okay. Um, you could go to the website of a university in the United States or in Britain, find the corresponding page, and see what they say. Any idea what they say? Validate sounds possible. In the United States, it's, you have to get accreditation, is the term they use. Okay. Uh, so there we have a range of possibilities. What are they? Let me check. Accreditation, accreditation. I still have the problem. I've got two terms in Spanish and one in English. So what do I do? What would you do? Anyone? Okay, let's put just accreditation. What are the risks involved? Well, there are two risks, and this is why purpose fails. I think there are two risks. Oh, let's see what happens here. Yeah, okay. One, if I just say accreditation, that sounds really nice and easy. The student could apply the American system, which is you go back to the university that issued the degree, and they give you a letter saying, yes, we issued this degree. That's accreditation, all right? And so they'll come to Spain, hit the beach with their degree and their accreditation. And the people there will say, oh no, oh no. You need homologación. And this means you have to send all your documents to Madrid with all the plan of studies for what you did, and it's going to take at least two years and we're going to see if everything you studied in the United States is the same as everything you study in Spain, for example, to have a degree in translation and interpreting. Very difficult, because I think there is only one program in the United States that does translation at BA level. So, uh, and uh, if there are problems and things lacking in that big super calculation, then you're going to have to convalidar. And convalidar means you get the credits recognized. We'll say, oh, you didn't do a course in conference interpreting, but you did one in consecutive. Uh, and we'll say that's enough. So we'll convalidate it. Okay? The student will logically just give up and go home because it's too damn complicated. That's the risk. Okay? The other risk is I could explain everything on this website. Well, actually, you have to try to get this in Madrid. It could take 18 months. And then if something's missing, then you have to go to get the car. Nobody will ever come. They'll give up because it's frightening. Right? So you've got these two risks. One risk is we give all the information and they get scared and run away. The other risk is we don't give enough information and they come and without the appropriate documents. So what's the solution? Well, as it happened, we looked around and we saw that this actual text was in two places on the website. Up the front end, next to the photo of the beach, and then further on when they, are you interested? Yes, click, do you need, to, uh, three clicks in, same text. So we translated it twice. Up the front, accreditation. Ah, come on, it's easy, hey, come to Spain, you know what, tick, tick, tick. And then we get down, and then we explain what homologación is, give the Spanish term, and then explain it, convalidación, give the Spanish term, then explain it, and then put links to the ministry website in Madrid so they get all the information they will ever need. It's a difficult problem, but why not do two different translations for two different purposes and thereby reduce the risks of failure? Failure in this case would be the student 
not starting their studies that they want to start. Okay? I'm applying the theory. Is it a lot of work? Well, the first one is low effort, just putting in accreditation. The second one isn't too bad either, because we were able to find on the ministry websites official descriptions of what these term means, these terms mean. So the risk was minimized, and the effort was not enormous. We worked where it counts, and not where it doesn't count. There we go. If you think about these examples, it suggests that linguistics is not going to help you with it, because the conditions are not in the text. Okay? You've really got to know a lot about the context and the people who are going to use them. The problems don't correspond to what Michael Agar calls the rich points. You might have heard about this through Christiana Nort. Uh, when two language systems are put into contact, you get rich points, which are the points at which the, the categories don't, don't correspond. Typically, for example, the T and V forms, the intimate and formal second persons. When I say Z and Du in German, is not the same as Vous, Tu in French, or Usted, Tu in Spanish. Okay, this is a rich point, lots of problems linguistically there, but often those problems are low risk. Did I give you the Vinay Dabelny solution? You know, for answer to toi, we'll use this intimate second person. How do you say that in English? Call me Bill. No problem. Yeah. Something similar with the same function, low effort solution, it works. So I'm not talking about rich points. I'm talking about something that's far more specifically embedded in the situation. And I'm not talking about difficulty. You know, some, some problems are difficult because of the number of solutions available or the difficulty of locating information. Um, difficulty only concerns risk management when you're considering the effort. Do I allocate effort there or not? And there it doesn't depend on the degree of difficulty, it depends on the risk involved. We find in classical risk theory, risk management theory, that there are three things you can do with it, with risk. Um, you can transfer it to somewhere else. This is what banks do with hedge funds. Okay, I've got too much risk here, I'll sell some of it on to somebody else. Um, in translation, risk transfer is what happens, for example, when you, you're really stuck, you've got a simple text there, you're not sure what it means, because there could be various purposes involved, so you just give a very literal translation. And you're not going to be wrong, but you're not going to be really right. Uh, and if it's wrong, you can always say, ah, it's not me, it was in the text. The author put it there. You, know, you transfer the risk to the author. Or, you pick up your phone and you ask your client, what do you want me to put here? Do you want me to use the formal or the informal second person? And the client says the formal, and if it's wrong, you said it's the client, not me. Okay, so there are forms of risk transfer or consulting an authority and using that authority so the risk goes to the authority and not to you. Uh, authoritative dictionary, for example, or uh, a glossary in the case of, of certain fields. That's risk transfer, and it's one of the strategies that people tend not to use enough. The second is risk aversion. Anytime there is risk, play safe. Uh, don't take a big bet. Don't do something risky. Risk aversion is, for example, you've got a specific term, you're not too sure, and you generalize. Did I teach you that? If in doubt, leave it out. Risk aversion or generalize. These are both risk averse strategies. It's too difficult there, too uncertain. Let me move back to where I'm safe. And the third, uh, risk seeking. Risk seekers are these people who do 
what do they call dangerous sports like you know alpine skiing and sky jump i don't know people who just live for the adrenaline rush of 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 living with risk um translators tend not to seek risks they tend to be quite averse to risk and i'm going to show you evidence of this but i confess that i really like conference interpreting I love getting in a booth. I love it when it's coming fast and hard and difficult. I really get a buzz out of the adrenaline rush of the risk you take. And I think in terms of personality, it might be that uh, conference interpreters, high-level conference interpreters, are given to taking risks, running risks, and enjoy it. I do. And people who like to hide behind a computer screen and just translate the words on the text and not really see people out there might be risk-averse personalities. I suspect that written translators, if they went to bet on horses, do you have horse racing? I don't, you've ever been, they would bet on the safe horses, you know, the favorites. Or if you're playing roulette, you might go on red or black but not a number. Okay. Do you need more examples? Okay, go, go out horse racing or gambling or something and discover what kind of risk profile you have as a person. It might tell you what you do as a translator. A doctoral student of mine did a study. We got some groups translating. She looked at, um, for a certain number of problems, at, at what solutions were proposed, what we got, this is a think aloud study, we got the translators to say what they were thinking about as they were doing the, the translating, they were solving the problem. So she located the solutions they had proposed and if they were high risk, low risk or risk transfer, and then the ones they decided on. Okay? So you can see here, for example, one of the translators Um, you've got risk-taking, risk-averse, and then risk-transfer. Uh, for that person, uh, generally, sometimes they take risks and they're constant with it, but the dominant strategy is to be risk-averse, and there is some significant risk-transfer. At one stage, she moved from... Uh, no, no increase the risk transfer. And so we get these profiles for different translators and we start to investigate how that relates to their personality. When training people in this, you have to try to train people to manage risk. And I think it's something we do intuitively without knowing it. Teachers know what they're trying to get students to do but they don't have the terms for it. Um, let's say there are four things you can do with risks, four behavior patterns now. There are three personality types, but there are, in this abstract grid, four behavior patterns. You've got a problem, and you can solve it with low effort or high effort. Okay? Things in between as well, obviously. And... There can be a low chance of adverse effect, that means you're playing it safe, okay, or a high chance of adverse effect, high risk. So if you like, in general terms, there's a low risk thing and a high risk thing. A person can apply low effort to a low risk problem, and that's rational, and that's good. That means they use risk aversion or risk transfer. Okay? And professionals do that a lot. Go fast where it doesn't matter. At the same time, a professional can go down sorry, to a high risk. They apply high effort to high risk. And that's good too. That's rational. High risk, you work on it. The other two squares are where we have problems. If you are not working hard enough on a high risk problem, then you're guessing. And when you guess, the chances are you get it wrong. 
Okay, so students, novices tend to use guesswork where professionals don't. And the other problem is that you work too hard, high effort on a low risk problem, and you get overwork. And that's the other problem we have with novices. Somehow, through practice, people pick up the skill of avoiding guesswork and avoiding overwork, of getting it right in distributing their effort. And this applies very much to conference interpreters, where effort is a limited commodity, but also to written translators. You start to realize that time is money, and not all your problems can be solved by working hard. They can be solved by thinking about the situation and who and where your effort is needed. Who needs your effort and where it is needed. I want to present some evidence for what I'm saying. Um, there's quite a lot of process study research. Um, this is, these are studies that look at the way people actually translate. They use think aloud protocols, people thinking, talking as they do it. Uh, increasingly, they use eye tracking. We can see where the eyes are moving on the computer screen, so we assume that where the eye is focused, that's where the, the cognitive effort is going. Um, and you can do things like just doing screen recording and having post-performance interviews. You get a person to talk about what they were doing when they were trying to solve that problem. Okay. Now, a set of studies have compared novices with professionals. And here are some of the results that they come up with. They find, for example, that professionals tend to work top-down more than novices who tend to work bottom-up. Do you know what these terms mean? Top-down means you get a big general principle. Oh, this text is designed to sell a car. And these are the kind of people who are going to buy this car. And this is the kind of strategy we're using to sell the car. Oh, and here's my translation problem. I've solved it because I'm thinking top-down. All right? A professional will tend to do that top-down processing from the big context to the little linguistic problem. Whereas novices tend to get a text and say, oh dear, um, I don't know that verb. I think it could go with this thing in the next sentence. Let me Google that one. Or let me go to a dictionary and try to figure that out. Then you build up all these little bits of information from the bottom, which forms a bigger unit. Oh, they're trying to sell a car. Okay? Uh, Bottom-up problem solving. Professionals go top-down in general. Novices go bottom-up in general. Um, it means that novices work too hard on everything because they can't see. Only with the big picture can you see where the risk distribution lies. If you just get into a text and start solving problems, you don't know what's high risk or what's low risk. So I think this bit of evidence supports my case that risk management is being used. It's found this is by, uh, a study by Alexander Künstli, that professionals tend to incorporate the client into the risk management process. Uh, this was a, a translation problem that had no clear solution. Uh, the novices would battle with it and choose one way or the other. The professionals would say, oh, I must ask the client, or they put in a footnote for the client, or attach a, a comment. To the document for the client. That is, professionals could use a risk transfer strategy. Ask someone. Whereas novices tend to get stuck. Oh dear, I'm too embarrassed. I am stupid. I don't know how to solve this problem. Yeah, that's one of the main problems. That you think you're stupid. You're not. You're human like everybody else. Use risk transfer. Ask someone. At the beginning of process studies, it was thought that um, professionals go faster, translate faster, because it's like riding a bike. Okay, remember riding a bicycle, learning how to ride a bicycle is really hard. You keep falling off and then your, your mum or your dad have to push you and you get really scared. It's a high risk activity. 
learning to ride a bike. Okay? But once you learn it, you've got it forever. And once you can go slow, then you can go fast. Okay? So it's sort of assumed that professionals, because they're always say, uh, solving the same kinds of problems, they will go faster and faster. Practice makes perfect. The studies show that this is not the case. They show that the difference is that novices tend to work hard in a constant way, whereas professionals will work a lot in one place, and then fast, and then a lot, and then fast, then a lot. That is, professionals have a redistribution of cognitive activity, which novices don't. I think the relation to risk is obvious in that case. And the final thing, is it? I don't know. Yes, it is. Uh, professionals are more realistic. That is, they realize they're not going to solve every problem. It's not going to be perfect. Translations are not designed to be perfect. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be exact in many cases. They have more confidence. That, that involves the confidence to use risk transfer to admit you don't know or to pretend you do in cases where it's low risk. That's also confidence. You could call it arrogance in some cases. And uh, they can be self-critical. That is, you can be aware that it's not the optimal solution, but also aware that it doesn't have to be. Uh, so those are human qualities uh, that are developed in the training process. And the key one there, I think, is confidence. Novices lack confidence. Because you lack confidence, you work too hard. So occasionally, though, I get especially conference interpreter students who have an excess of confidence, bordering on extreme arrogance, and somehow know they can get away with murder if they sound good in their target language. If they just sound, it sounds like it's supposed to sound, that'll be good enough. The sad story is, often, it works. Except in high-risk cases. Other evidence for my model comes from uh, the study of universals. Do you know what translation universals are? Studies of translations compared with non-translations, which can be star texts or parallel texts, that is, texts that haven't been translated and texts that have been translated, throw them all into a, an electronic corpus, do a linguistic analysis of the differences between those two corpora, and you find that translations tend to have some features that non-translations don't have. And those features are tentatively called universals. I don't think they're universal, but that's, that's what researchers decided to call them. Uh, Levy called them tendencies, okay? tendencies that are in translated language. One is lexical simplification. Translations tend to use fewer different words um, yeah, a narrower range of different words. Uh, it's a type-token ratio. Okay, with a type, you have a number of types, these are all the different words used in your text, and the tokens are the number of times each is used. Okay, the translations will, will, won't have as many different words. They are poorer lexically. Why? Because translators generalize or omit features. And so this comes out in the linguistic analysis. Another universal is explicitation. Translations tend to have more explicit syntactic connections than non-translations. For example, in English, I can say, the man I saw. Or, okay, the man I saw, let's stay with that. Sexist, the woman I saw. I don't see. Uh, or I can say, the woman that I saw. I can put in that or leave it out. Spoken language tends to leave it out. Written language often puts it in, but written translations really put it in a lot. Okay? Written translations tend to be more explicit syntactically than non-translations. 
They are playing it safe. They don't want to run the risk that the reader might misunderstand. So syntactically, it's more elaborate, and this can be read as being risk-averse. Doesn't apply in conference interpreting. This is for written translation. Explicitation could also be, did I give you the example of Eton? Uh, it's a famous debate, people in uh, Paul Kussbaum, uh, Hans Hernig, Kussbaum especially, uh, wrote that in, translating into German from English, if you've got the phrase eaten, E-T-O-N. Have I done this with you? No? Okay. Eaten is a, um, a school for rich boys, traditionally. Okay? It's a private exclusive English school in England called public schools, but they are private. Very complicated. Thing. Okay. Uh, they argued that when going from English into German, you should put in German the exclusive private school, Eton. You take this knowledge, which people in English are aware of, that's implicit in English, and make it explicit in German, to make it clear to the reader what they're talking about. This was a debate because I remember um, Paul Kussmaul presenting this at a, at a, in, in England at a, at a, in a seminar and, and Peter Newmark, an English translation theorist, was there. And he said, oh, how dare you insult the reader like this. Everybody knows about Eton. Even educated Germans know about Eton. You are insulting the reader. And they had this argument about whether or not translations, and, and the argument was that translations are making things too easy for readers instead of making the readers work. Okay? Explicitation suggests that translators do that for readers. They tend to want to make things too clear. Uh, Georges Mounin, say 63 years ago, said the main problem in translation is over-translation. People work too hard at it, make things too simple, instead of making it a viable, dynamic text in its own right. And so there the debate lies. But the evidence suggests that explicitation is widespread among translations. It's a feature of risk aversion. Adaptation. Translations tend to adapt the discursive norms of the target culture. Uh, that it starts to sound white, like what is normal in the target culture. This is also risk aversion, I think. It doesn't want the reader to get upset or to inquire too much. And then a very interesting one is unique terms. If you get two languages and you compare them, you find that there are features that occur in one but not in the other. And we're calling these unique terms. For example, comparing English and German. Uh, German has these modal particles that are really cool and hard to use. Doch, noch, schon. Right? Which, which have a wonderful expressive capacity in German, but don't really exist in English. Uh, the hypothesis is that translations from English into German will not use as many of these as the non-translations. You get ten translations into German and look for noch, doch, schon, and ten, what this? These were translations, and these are non-translations, text originally written in German in the same genre, look for the same items. I bet that there are more here than there. That is, translations into a language tend not to use the resources that are specific to that language. Another example is, ah, oh, Catalan, you don't know. Catalan's a wonderful language because it has a really cool past tense. For anything in the past, you get the verb to go as an auxiliary and add the infinitive. Yeah. So I can say, ahí va guanyar al Barça. Last night, Barcelona won against Real Madrid. Okay, and the past tense is va guanya. It's just 
verb auxiliary, go, and the infinitive. Beautiful thing, easy to use, you can never go wrong. Foreigners like me love it. I just use that tense all the time because the other ones are hard. Okay, hard to decline, and, and you've got irregular verbs and all this rubbish. So, uh, this is a unique item in Catalan. So I get bodies of translations into Catalan, and I bet that the translations don't use this tense as much as the non-translations, and it happens to be the case. Other example, going into English, there is a, a peculiar tense um, with the verb to be, like, they are to be married. He is to, Charles is to be king. It's like a future tense that is all decided. All right? Very hard to render into other languages and not frequent in translations. Okay? Uh, how does that relate to risk? Well, translators are using risk transfer. They're following what's in the source text rather than exploit, exploiting or working hard on the, the repertoire of, of available resources in the target language. They're playing it safe. Final uh, one is called equalizing. This uh, hypothesizes, well, it, it observes that in all languages you have extremes of discourse, from discourse that's highly informal and spoken, and discourse that is highly formal and written. There's orality and, and literateness. Okay, complex, well, both, both could be complex, but uh, um, texts that are non-translations can exploit these extremes. You can move from highly colloquial language to highly formal language. Certainly in our languages we can do that. We have that range, that repertoire of what the language can do. It's found that the forms at the ends, the highly spoken ones and the highly liter literate ones, tend to disappear in translation. Translations sort of go for the middle ground. Get rid of the extremes. Don't take risks. Make sure everybody understands what the text is about. This also means that translations tend to be boring. You know, they're, they're understandable, they're informative, they're helpful, but they're boring. Anodyne would be a better term. In all, these universals seem to be telling the same story, that translators tend to be risk-averse. I'm talking about written translators tend to be risk-averse. And I'm worried about that. I'm worried about it because of democracy in Europe, which depends on a multilingual regime where translation is the key. Not just in the actual translations being boring, which they are, and the website's even more boring, which they are. If you don't believe me, go into the website of Barack Obama and then go into the website of the President of the European Commission, if anybody knows who that is. Okay? And just, just compare them. And tell me which one is exciting, which one interests you, which one you want to click on, which one you don't want to touch. All right? Okay, or the information website of the American government, which is bilingual, by the way, and the information website of the Europa portal. Oh, where do I click? I've got all these little things. The information's all there. We've got tons of information in Europe, but it's not exciting. It's not, it's not motivating to people. This is because not just that the translations tend to do all these things, but that people are writing text to be translated. People are writing in such a way that the translation can become possible or easy, which means that they are reproducing key terms over and over and not exploiting the resources of our languages. Which is why if I ask people, where are you from, what's your country? Everybody says, oh, I'm Austrian or Polish or Spanish or whatever. Because you speak these languages, you can live in these languages, uh, and you can identify with them. Nobody says they're European. Why would you? But there's no language to live in that would enhance that identity. Not yet, perhaps. We'll see what happens. I'm 
Do you see? Ah, do you see my concern? I, I think translators and and people communicating in Europe should learn to take more risks and make life more exciting, uh, more debate, more cross-cultural exchange. That's valid exchange to and fro, rather than just presenting information. If this is true, if translators are risk averse, why would it be true? Possible reasons are translators are not told about the context in which their work is to be used. That is, you're not given the information so you could see success conditions and therefore analyze the risk. And it's true, mostly we get a text to translate. And if I ask why, and they say, oh, it's urgent. No, some, it's not, often you know with a client, if you work with a client over, over a period of time, you know what they want and what they don't want. But, but okay, there's a problem there. Translators professionally are not responsible for risk management. And it's true. There's a film called Patton. Patton, George Patton was the American general in charge, I think, of the Seventh Army that occupied Berlin at the end of the Second World War. And in the film, there's a wonderful scene where the American general is sitting next to the Russian general, and they are celebrating the victory, and there are Cossack dances and lots of vodka. And, well, it's a party, except the Americans are not joining in. And then Patton calls over his interpreter, and he says, tell the Russian general he's a son of a bitch. And the interpreter, I can't tell him that, sir. Interpreter, interpreter a high risk utterance. You know, omit, omit, <laughs> play it safe, omit. Patton says, tell him he's a son of a bitch. I can't, sir, it'll be World War Three. You tell him he's a son of a bitch. Interpreter goes over, Russian, ch -ch -ch, Russian back, ch -ch -ch, comes back, sir, he says, you're a son of a bitch too. And then the two generals toast, they understand each other perfectly, they understand they agree to disagree, okay, that they agree to dislike each other, and the celebration proceeds. Message one, the interpreter was correct to use their intercultural competence to indicate a high-risk utterance. Okay. Two, generals are paid for high-risk decisions, interpreters are not. Okay. If you're going to make those decisions yourself, make sure you're paid to do it. But in the current state of affairs, generals get a salary that is far higher than interpreters. I'm not suggesting that translators should be conducting international events. There's also a, a, a mathematical argument to be made that uh, the cheaper the communication, the easier it is to make sure everybody has benefits from it. Okay, So there is a certain um, logical argument uh, that interpreters will not work hard because, or translators will not work hard because it would, they would be too expensive. And if it's too expensive to get a mediator in, then there won't be many mediated communic uh, communications and people will find other solutions like learning languages. Uh, so our profession has a certain interest in keeping costs low. That's a very perverse argument and one that all the professionals will argue against, but it might explain one of the reasons why the prices for translations in some countries have been declining in recent years. Also, the quality of translations. It will be logical that the quality of translations will decline if the corresponding demand is not there because people are learning English. It's not, not a fatality. Yeah. My argument is that our services are required only for high-risk communication situations. Therefore, high level of competence, high level of effort is required, and that low-risk communications will be done through Google Translate or people learning bad English and the other solutions that are there. 
uh, uh, services are for high-risk situations. So we should think about why we tend to be risk averse.